Welcome, AutoWebZone, to the first uh, Teacher's Talks. Uh, I'm Sean Godden. I'm a former uh, Ottawa Carleton District School Board uh, teacher, uh, taught at Crean Wilson for about 20 years. Um, and this talk is called Fun with Fractions, uh, Fractions and Decimals. Uh, so we're going to be looking at um, some fractions and decimals. Um, before I begin, um, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, where I live is on unceded uh, Algonquin territory, and I'd like to thank the Algonquin uh, people for hosting us on their land. Now, before we jump in, um, this is meant for uh, sort of for the teachers. Um, you might find some things that you can work into your classroom, um, but this isn't meant to be sort of pedagogy. Um, this is sort of for your own recreation. Um, as such, you're taking the roles of the student, and uh, it's good to be um, as active as possible when working through mathematics. So there's going to be some times when I ask you to um, pause the video and uh, work things out. And I strongly encourage you, um, if you think of something um, as the video is going along, pause it, grab a piece of paper, uh, work something out um, before things go on. Try to be as active uh, in this as possible. And on that note, I'd strongly suggest that at this point, um, seeing our title is called uh, Fractions and Decimals, um, take a second, pause the video, and write down everything that you know about uh, fractions and their decimal representation. Um, and sort of keep that list handy so that uh, by the end of the video you can uh, sort of see if I've hit everything on your list and see if there's anything that you learn along the way. So pause before we go on. All right. Now, my intention with these things is uh, to make them short, um, sort of around half an hour-ish, uh, um, but I tend to um, get a little carried away with things. And so with this original idea, when I started working on it, um, I saw that the whole thing's probably going to be too long, so I'm going to break it up into two parts. The second part will come out um, after um, the Christmas break. So this first part is called the introduction and terminating decimals, which sort of give away a little bit of where we're going. Okay, so if we're interested in um, working out um, what the de decimal representation of fractions are and how those things behave, one great way um, of tackling a problem is just sort of jump in head first and work some stuff out. Um, so I would probably start with uh, the unit fractions and I'd work out you know, one half, one third, one quarter, one fifth, and so on down the line. See what happens, see if I can see any patterns. Sometimes when you start seeing patterns that helps to um, figure out where we're going to go next. So if we figured out one half as a decimal, most of you, hopefully all of you know already it's 0 0.5 and uh, we could do that either by hand or on a calculator um, and note that that's what we call a terminating decimal. In other words, the digits in the decimal representation stop. You know, there are infinitely many zeros after uh, the five, but we don't write those down because they don't tell us anything about um, the number. So that's that one. Um, but if we go to the next one, we get 0 0.3333333333, and that keeps going and going and going. Um, if you do it on a calculator, you just see a, a, the screen full of threes, but um, if you do it by hand, you see that this process is going to keep going. Uh, we have, there's various ways to write this. Um, when I was in school, there was kind of two accepted ways. One with the bar over it like this, um, where you 
put a bar over all the stuff that repeats. Um, the other was using dots, where you put dots over the first uh, number that repeats and the last number that repeats. I kind of like the bar because it's easier to see, um, so I'll be using that one. Um, this is called a periodic decimal because there's a period, in this case the period is one, it repeats every one, um, and at a certain point the decimals just keep repeating or the, the digits keep repeating. Continuing, the next two are terminating, and again those should be well known, and the next two are periodic. Um, one seventh becomes a little bit interesting because now I've got something that has quite a long period. It goes at one, four, two, eight, five, seven. Uh, that's called the reptend of the repeating decimal, the part that repeats. And we'd say that this is periodic with period six because there's six digits um, being repeated in the decimal. Okay. So at this point, hopefully a couple questions come to mind. So the first thing, we've done the first six uh, fractions, uh, sort of um, unit fractions, and we saw that we got periodic and, uh, and terminating decimals. We might ask, could something else happen if we had um, a fraction? Could it be something other than those two things? And second question, is there some way that we could figure out whether it's going to be terming, uh, terminating periodic or something else without ha actually having to do the work to work it out? Now, in these cases, we just jam these things into our calculators and we get an idea. But we'll see, or you'll see, that there's some fractions that, because of the small screen in your calculator, um, you can't tell from the display screen whether the thing is periodic or repeating. Um, and you'd actually have to do things longhand in order to do that. So we want to know if there's a way that we can actually do that without having to do all the work. So to get an idea, we're going to go a little old school and instead of going to our calculator, we're going to do this longhand. We're going to do long division. One quarter um, is really another way of saying one divided by four. Um, so we're going to go through the long division to see what happens in the long division to see if there's any clues there. So again, um, first thing we do is we look and say, does four go into one? No, it doesn't. It goes in zero times. Generally, we you could write you know zero times four is zero with zero remainder and keep going from there, but at the beginning we usually save some space and then just sort of say okay I'm gonna have to go beyond the decimal. Keep in mind that one is the same as one point zero zero zero. I can throw in as many zeros as I want, um, and now we sort of take down the next number and we look at this four go into ten, and yes it does it goes in twice. Um, 4 times 2 is 8, and now we can subtract, and we've got 2 remainder. So our next step, we can bring down one of these zeros and go through the same process. Does 4 go into 20? Well, actually, yeah, it does. 4 times 5 is exactly 20. Um, so I've got 0 remainder, which means that if I bring down zeros, I'm not going to change anything. So I'm actually done. So one quarter is 0 0.25. Done. Now let's look at the other extreme. Let's look at 1 seventh, which we saw goes on a little bit longer. So again, it goes in no times. Now I look at the 7 going to 10. Yes, it does. One time. Go bring it down. Um, leaves a remainder of 3. I bring down my 0. Does 7 go into 30? Yep four times, bring it down, remainder of two, does four go into 20? Yep, twice. Does four go into 60? Yep, eight times. Does four go into 40? Yep, five times. And we just keep going. And eventually, um, we'll see this thing starts to repeat. 
Now, is that enough to know that it's repeating? I don't know. Let's take a closer look. So, if we look at the remainders of um, our one quarter, you remember the first time four went into one zero times. So it's really like I went one minus zero is one. Uh, so my first remainder was one, and then my next remainder is two, and my next remainder was zero. Over here with the uh, one seven, again, my first remainder was one, then my next remainder was three, wrote down zero, and then two, six, four, two, one, and so on down the line. So if I look at the remainders, the remainders start repeating. It goes one, three, two, six, four, five, one, three, two, and so on down the line. Now, if we look kind of a little bit closer at what's happening at um, when it repeats and compare that to what's happening at the beginning, if I look at the first chunk of my division, when it goes in one, um, I have my remainder three, brought down the zero, four times uh, seven is 28, and we get down to remainder two, and we continue from there. And now if we look down at the end, where that one repeats, look what happens. As soon as I got that remainder of one, well, I'm going to bring in a zero and make a 10, exactly the same thing as here. Well, as soon as I bring in that 10, it's going to go in one times, just like the beginning. Um, it's going to leave a remainder of three, just like the beginning. Um, I'm going to bring down uh, the zero for the two, just like the beginning, and it's going to continue. So as soon as we hit um, one of these remainders being exactly the same, it's going to have to repeat from that point forward. So let's draw some conclusions. So when we're performing the long division, uh, we create a decimal representation of a fraction. And if we look at the remainders, eventually one of two things is going to happen. First thing that can happen is we get a remainder of zero at some point. And if we get a remainder of zero at some point, we're done. Um, and so that's going to be a terminating decimal. However, if we don't get a zero, um, at some point, we have to get a remainder that repeats. And if you think, this has to happen. Uh, if we look at that 1 7th, the only thing the remainders could be is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Um, if we get a remainder of 0 somewhere, it's going to be terminating. Otherwise, I've got remainders of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. I've only got six numbers to deal with. And the only way I can um, go about um, trying not to get a repetition is by going through those numbers and after six numbers there's nothing left to choose from. Whatever the remainder is going to be has to repeat one of the first ones. And in this case it turns out that we sort of kept the repeating off as long as possible. Um, we ended up repeating after um, we've gone through all of the remainders, all the possible remainders, and then it's going to be periodic. So that tells us that that's sort of our answer to our first question. Every rational number's decimal representation has to be either periodic or terminating. So we either have to, through that long division process, run into a zero, in which case it's going to stop, or eventually it has to repeat. And if you think about it, um, if you look at your denominator, whatever your denominator is, um, if it's going to repeat, you can't use a zero, and you can't use the number that the denominator is. So the longest it can repeat is actually one less than your denominator. So when we had one seventh, the longest the repeating part, or the longest the length of our, um, or our period could be was six. It turns out that's the case. Um, if you look at our one third, which is 0.333, the longest it could be would be three minus one, which is two. Now, it turned out it repeated before that. Same thing with one six. One six, it could have been five units long. It turned out to be only one before it repeated. Okay. 
But again, we still have to answer that second question. Can we tell, without having to go through that long division, whether it's going to be uh, terminating or periodic? Because as our numbers get bigger, that long division is going to get longer. Um, unless you're a computer programmer and you can program the computer to do it, um, or you use something like Wolfram Alpha, um, it'd be nice to be able to tell um, whether it's going to be periodic or um, um, terminating without having to go through that process. Okay, so to get us along there, um, I've come up with um, a set of fractions that I want you to convert to decimals. Um, this is an exercise I actually give to my grade nine students, or I used to do when I was teaching, um, at the beginning of the year. And uh, we'd sort of do a whole investigation uh, from there. Um, write these out in decimal form. And I want you to see and explain as many patterns as you can. So looking for patterns is really important in mathematics. Uh, it helps us solve lots of problems. But even more important is when we find a pattern to see if we can logically explain why this thing happens. Because sometimes patterns that we see might not continue. But if we can actually explain why a pattern is happening, that gives us a really good indication that our pattern will continue. And it also gives us some insight as to why it's happening. So I strongly suggest that you um, pause the video and take a few minutes to play around with this and see everything that you can find. Okay. So let's look at these things uh, one at a time and see what we can find out. Um, so first thing that you should have seen, or hopefully that you saw at some point before even doing any calculations, is that the fractions that I've given you are the reciprocals of the powers of two. So one half is one over two to the one, one quarter, one over two to the two, and so on down the line. So I picked these for a very specific reason. So let's go and see what happens. Now, again, we can work these out as decimals. The first two we've already done uh, at the beginning. The next two um, continue there. Is there anything that we see? Yeah, you might see some things. You might see things ending with fives. You might see one after the decimal place, two after the decimal place, three after the decimal place, four after the decimal place. Kind of neat. Um, but let's dig deeper because 0.5, there's another way we can write that as a fraction. We can write that as 5 over 10 and 25 over 100 and so on. Uh, 125 over 1,000. A little typo there. Um, 625 over 10,000. And now let's think about uh, our operations on fractions. If I wanted to convert this 1 half to uh, 5 tenths, what would I have to do? What would I have to do to one quarter to make it 25 over 100 and so on down the line? So one half, if I multiply the numerator and denominator, I'd get this equivalent fraction, 5 tenths. Okay. So I'm multiplying by 5 or 5 to the exponent of 1. Um, for one quarter, I multiply by 25 or 5 to the exponent of 2. So it's multiplying the 2 to the exponent of 2 by 5 to the exponent of 2, and the same thing down the line. I'm multiplying by 5 to the 3 and 5 to the 4. Why? Because my denominator, I'm, we're working with a base 10 system, which is 2 times 5. So to convert these fractions that deal with um, powers of 2, the reciprocals, to convert them into decimal, I have to make them powers of 10 in the denominator, so I have to multiply by powers of 5. So as a result, a couple things happen. Look at this. This is 10 to the 1. That's why there's one decimal. 10 to the 2, 2, and 3, and 4. And if I look at the actual digits, 0.5, 5 to the 1 is 5, 0.25, 5 squared is 25, 0.125, 5 to the 3, and 5 to the 4. 
And if we jump to our head and say, wait a second, if 5 times 2 is 10, and all these powers of 2, the reciprocals have this uh, property with um, the powers of 5, what happens if we look at the reciprocals of the powers of 5? And look what happens. 5 to the 1, 1 decimal place, 5 to the 2, 2, 3, and 4. And if we look at the digits, 2, 4, 8, 16, are just our powers of 2, just the opposite happening. So, that leads us to a conjecture, okay? Um, now, your, your first level conjecture might be, well, if I've got reciprocals of powers of 2, um, my decimal representation is going to look like powers of 5. But if we think of that key step, we got that because we know it's going to be over something that's a power of 10. And the 2 to the exponent times 5 to the exponent given by 10 to the exponent. So we can actually go a little bit further and say that if a is a factor of some power of 10, in other words, I can find number b so that those two things multiply to a power of 10, which are powers of 2 and powers of 5 work, but there's other things. Then that representation of 1 over a, there's going to be a couple things that happen. First of all, it's going to be terminating because I can get this denominator of this. I can get a common denominator of a power of 10, which means I can write it exactly in decimal notation. Um, because it's going to be a power of 10, if I know what the power or the exponent of uh, that is, that tells me it's going to be that many digits long. And the next thing is it's going to be made up of the digits of b. So 1 over a is going to contain the digits of b, and with possibly some leading zeros in front. So that's our conjecture. Next thing we should try to do is actually try to see if we can justify this or prove it. So for example, um, 80 times 125 is 10,000. Uh, 1 over 80 has the digits of 125 in it, and 1, 2, 3, 4, made up of four decimals. Okay? And the other way around, um, we get that. Now, notice that we usually wouldn't write this as 0 0.0080, uh, but because of how I've teamed these two things together, it actually makes sense. So let's try to prove this. I'm going to pick, suppose that I have two numbers that multiply to a power of 10. If I look at this uh, reciprocal 1 over a and say, well, I can find an equivalent fraction by multiplying it by the numerator and denominator by b. That's going to give me 1 times b is b. a times b is 10 to the n. And I get b over 10 to the n. Well, if I'm over 10 to the n, that means it's going to have uh, n decimal places. And b is just going to be the digits. So let's look at it in terms of our example. If I was dealing with 1 over 80, 80 times 125 is um, our 10,000. So this gives me my 125 over 10,000. And I get the digits of the number that multiplies with 80. And it's four digits long because I'm multiplying to um, 10 to the 4. So, next thing we should figure out is, okay, what are numbers that go into 10 to the n going to look like so that we can use this rule that we just came up with? So, 10 to the n, well, 10 is 2 times 5. So, 10 to the n through our rules of powers is just going to be 2 to the n times 5 to the n, or you can think of this as this is going to be 2 times 5 times 2 times 5 a bunch of times. Since um, um, multiplication is commutative and associative, we can actually change the order. The order that we multiply things in doesn't matter, so we can bring all the 2s together and all the 5s together. And we end up with this. So that tells us that the factors of this are the numbers that only have 2s and 5s as their prime factors. 
So that means numbers that are going to be of the form 2 to some exponent times 5 to some exponent. So let's look at some examples of these things. So let's just pick a bunch of numbers at random. Um, 15 to 625, if I factor that out, it turns out to be 5 to the 6. Is it made up of only 2s and 5s? Yep, it's got only 5s. Yep, so it's decimal. It's going to be 0, 0, 0, 0.64 because its partner would be 2 to the 6, which is 64, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 decimal places. Next, 75. 75 is 3 times 5 to the 2. Well, it's got some 5s, but it's got something that isn't a 2 or a 5, which means it is not a candidate. And if we work that out as decimal, look at that. It's periodic. 3200, we do the factorization, 2 to the 7 times 5 to the 2. Only 2s and 5s? Yep. If we work it out as a decimal, it's terminating. Um, and if you worked out 3125 times 3200, you're going to get this 1 million. Oh, sorry, 10 million. 111, 3 times 37, doesn't have 2s or 5s at all, so of course it's not a candidate. And if we work that out as a decimal, I get the uh, periodic uh, decimal uh, 0 0.009 repeated. Okay, so it seems that we figured out when we're going to get terminating and when we're not going to get terminating. So, in order to be able to look at a fraction and decide whether it's going to be terminating or not, we need to know whether it's a power of 2 times a power of 5. Now again, it would be nice to be able to spot that quickly. So let's take a look at some of these things. So um, let's look at powers of 2. Powers of 2 look like 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, and so on. What do we know about these numbers? Well, they're all even uh, because they're powers of 2. Um, what else do we notice? Um, the units digits are 2, 4, 6, or 8. Now, we know for even numbers, even numbers can end in 2, 4, 6, 8, or 0. Um, if it's going to be a power of 2, we're not going to get that 0. Okay. What about powers of 5? Well, there they are. So anything we notice about them? They're odd. Okay. Um, the units digits for every single one is going to be 5. So that's kind of easy to spot. For exponents 2 and up, so I'm going to end with 2, 5. So 25, 1, 25, 6, 25, 31, 25, and so on. So that's a good sign. And for exponents 3 or up, it goes either 1, 2, 5, or 6, 2, 5. So you've got 1, 2, 5, 6, 2, 5, 1, 2, 5, 6, 2, 5. Sort of bouncing back and forth. So there's some patterns that we can see um, to tell if it's a pure power of 2 or a pure power of 5. The pure power of 2 isn't too enlightening. Uh, we just can tell from the, the last digit, and then we just have to keep going through and dividing. But what happens if I'm multiplying a power of 2 times a power of 5? So let's again look at some patterns. I'm going to look at 2 to the 1 times powers of 5. So 2 times 5 is 10, 2 times 25 is 50, and so on. Um, then we'll do this systematically. Now I'll do 2 to the 2 times powers of 5. I get 20, 100, and so on. 2 to the 3 times powers of 5. I get 40, 200, 1,000, and so on. Um, remember that we saw that um, when I get 2 times 5, I get 10. So that if I get 2 squared times 5 squared, which is our second one, I should get 10 squared, which is 100. 2 to the 3 times 5 to the 3, 10 cubed, which is there. Now we'll do the same thing for 5 times powers of 2. So 5 times powers of 2, 25 or 5 squared times powers of 2, 125 times powers of 2. So again, see if you can spot any patterns in these things. Um, and 
We'll take a look at it. First thing that jumped out at me is if I look at this 2 times power of 5, after the first term, if I ignore the zeros, at the end I get 5, 25, 125, 625, which are just the powers of 5. So I get the powers of 5 uh, with a zero at the end sort of shifted over one spot. Well, what happens when I go times 2 to the 2? There's my powers of 5 again, shifted over two spots, ending in two zeros. Times 2 to the 3, there they are again, shifted over three spots with three zeros. What about when we do um, powers of 5 times the powers of 2? Same thing. Now, this has been shifted over one spot, and there's my powers of 2 ending in 1 zero. Two spots, my powers of 2 ending in 2 zeros. Three spots, my powers of 2 ending in 3 zeros. So it looks like we've got a pattern here that if we can kind of spot um, the powers of 2 and 5, um, you know, zeros at the end tell us that we're going to have some 2s and 5s. So it looks like the digits of that, 2 to the a times 5 to the b, are the digits of a power of 2 or 5, followed by a bunch of zeros. Now again, it'd be nice to figure out more precisely what's going on, but let's see if we can prove that. So, there's three things that can happen. Case number one, if the exponent of the power of 5 is bigger than the exponent of the power of the 2, then that number I can write using our power laws. Um, I can really just think of this as having all these extra uh, 5s. I can write this as a bunch of 2s together, then the same number of 5s together with some extra 5s at the end. And if I look at that, I have the same number of twos and fives. And so I have 10 to some exponent times a power of five, which is a power of five followed by a bunch of zeros. If I look at if the power of two is bigger, we can do the same thing with the twos. I can group some twos, the same number of twos with the fives that we have at fives with the extra twos at the beginning, those things become a power of 10 and I get a power of two followed by a bunch of zeros. Now the third case I won't show is what happens if these things are equal. Well then I have exactly 10 to some power which is easy to spot because that's one followed by a bunch of zeros. So if we look at these a little bit closer we see something else that happened. Now, as I pointed out, the first thing that jumps out at us was these powers of 10 when our, um, we have equal numbers of twos and fives in our products, okay? Um, we also saw that beyond that point, we just get, and here when I've got my powers of five, I just get my powers of five followed by one zero, powers of five, by two zeros follows a five by three zeros, powers of two by one, two or three zeros down here. Now what about before? If we look at those, in this case I've got a two, and this one I've got two four, which are powers of two. Now why is that happening? Well, it's because I've got two to the three here, and for the first two cases I have more twos than fives. So I'm going to see that power of 2. And same thing down here. Here I've got more 5s than 2s, so I get a 5 times um, a 10, and here I get a 5 times 100, and a 25 times a 10. Um, so we're going to sort of see spread out from that these powers of 2, the powers of 5, if we kept doing these things further and further. And if we went way down the line, if we went like 2 to the 6 times powers of 5, Look what we get. We get all of these things. In the middle, we get that one million when we have 
5 to the 6 times 2 to the 6. On the other side of that, I get more 5s. So 6 of the 5s match up with um, 6 of the 2s to give us our million or our 6 zeros. And then I got one extra 5, so I get 5 million, I get 2 extra 5s, so 25 million, and so on. But before that, I have more of these 2s than the 5s. Um, in this case, I only have 4 5s. All of those 4 5s get uh, converted, uh, get paired up with a 2 to turn into 10s, and I got one 2 left over. When I have, uh, or sorry, 5 of them, when I have 4 of them, 4 of them go together uh, with the 2s to make 4 powers of 10, and 2 of the 2s are left over, 3 of them, 3 of the 2s. So I get my powers of 2 coming this way. And same sort of thing if I do a big power of 5 times powers of 2, we're going to get this in the middle when I've got 5 to the 5 times 2 to the 5. I get my power of 10. Beyond that, I get my powers of 2 times um, uh, 10 to the 5. And before that, I get my powers of 5 times smaller powers of 10. So let's con refine that conjecture. Um, the digits of those uh, powers of 2 times powers of 5 are going to be um, the, poly the powers, of, the digits of 2 to the a minus b, followed by b zeros if a is bigger than b. Uh, 5 to the b minus a, followed by a zeros if a is less than b. And a 1 followed by a or b zeros if they're equal to each other. And now if we take that conjecture, the whole reason we're looking at um, what these powers of 2 times powers of 5 are is so that we could look at these fractions that um, have that as a denominator. So the de decimal representation of 1 over uh, 2 to the a times 5 to the b is going to be a digits long made up the digits of 5 to the a minus b if that uh, if a is greater than b because we saw that we're going to get to the biggest power of 10. So if there's if a is the biggest, I'm going to have to multiply the top and bottom by 5 to the a minus b to catch it up. Um, because it's a digits long, I'm going to have, um, or sorry, I'm going to have my tower power of um, 10 to the a in the denominator. It's going to be digits, digits long. Um, if b is the biggest, then it's going to be b digits long, and I'm going to have the powers of 2. And if they're the same, it's going to be um, a 1. And 0, 0, 0, 1 is going to be that many digits long. And in each case, we pad things, start with the number of zeros that we need to make it to the correct length. So let's look at a couple of examples of this. So if we look at 2 to the 3 times 5 to the 7, um, if we're considering this uh, number, we see that 3 is the smaller. So we're going to have 3 zeros at the end of this number. Um, if I subtract the exponent, 7 minus 3 is 4. And 5 to the 4 is 625, because 5 had the bigger exponent. So my number should be 625000. If we want to do the reciprocal now, again, 7 is the biggest number. So that means it's going to be 7 digits long. Here, 3 was the smallest. That's the most tens we can make. Here, because I'm going to have to get a denominator that has powers of 10, I'm going to have to augment things and sort of bring everything up to the same level. So it's going to be 7 digits long. Again, 7 minus 3 is 4, which means I'm going to have to multiply the numerator and denominator by 2 to the 4th, which is 16. So that's going to end up in my decimal representation. And so my decimal representation is going to be 7 digits long, and it's going to be made up of the digits of 2 to the 4 with a bunch of zeros in the front. One more example, 2 to the 10, 5 to the 5. Maybe try this yourself. Again, pause and 
look to see if you can kind of just write down what this is going to look like um, without having to do some computations and what its reciprocal is going to look like. Biggest exponent is with the, um, the 2. So the smallest exponent is 5, so I'm going to have 5 zeros. The 2 is going to have 5 uh, left over in its exponent. 2 to the 5 is 32. So this is going to be 32 followed by 5 zeros, or 3,200,000. For the reciprocal, the biggest is 10, so it's going to be 10 digits long. The 5 has to get caught up to the 2's, so 5 to the 5 is 3125. So this is going to have 3125 as its decimals, and it's going to be 10 digits long, so I have to pad it with a bunch of zeros. Okay, and that's the end of part one. Um, again, much longer than I thought. Um, we only looked at terminating decimals and sort of classified what a terminating decimal will look like, what uh, will give us terminating decimal, and, and actually some idea of picking apart how its decimal representation is going to be um, in January. Part two will be released, and this will deal with periodic decimals. And between now and then, maybe play around with um, things that are periodic. See if you can figure out um, what's going on. We kind of uh, come up with a way to determine whether um, a fraction is going to be periodic or not. But now it'd be nice to know if we can figure out, you know, how long, what, uh, what's going to be the length of our period, um, what numbers are going to be in it, um, how can I tell um, how long it's going to be without having to go through um, a lot of work, and what sort of things can happen. So, have fun, hope you enjoyed this, and uh, have a great Christmas break.